Thanks to Curiosity Stream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. So, um, I got married. <laughs> And it turns out that we went on honeymoon on the train through France and Spain at the worst possible time for a climate-based YouTuber because I missed all the news. Thing is, perhaps you did too. Yes, Biden's climate bill got passed and that's received tons of attention already. In particular, Hank Green's done an excellent breakdown here on YouTube. But two huge other stories also happened in August and received only perfunctory coverage in Western media. I'm talking about the floods in Pakistan, which have got a bit more attention, and the heat wave and drought in China, which you may not be aware of, but should be. To bring you up to speed, starting in late August, Pakistan experienced its worst flooding this century. Like, at one point, a third of the country was underwater. And this has been a, a disaster. This has displaced something like 33 million people and killed, as of the time of recording, 1,300 people. In China, however, the problem is not too much water, but not enough. Specifically, the Yangtze, which is the third largest river in the world, is incredibly low right now. Now, you may have heard that the Rhine was so low this summer that scuttled Nazi ships became visible. Well, in Chongqing, the Yangtze became so low that Buddhist statues were revealed that were 600 years old. The river flow is 50% lower than the average of the past five years. This is a really historic drought in China right now. It's a big deal for movement on the river, which is crucial to both the Chinese and the global economy, to the supply of drinking water, but also to the ability to generate hydropower. Sichuan, where the Yangtze flows, gets 80% of its electricity from hydro, and this summer demand is up by 25%, and the available water has gone down by 50%. That's not good. Naturally, the question to ask here is why? Why are these things happening? And the answer is, as you've probably already pieced together, likely climate change but expressed in two very different ways. The floods in Pakistan were preceded by an extreme heat wave earlier this summer. As was reported in Nature, in April and May, temperatures reached above 40 degrees Celsius for prolonged periods in many places. On one sweltering day in May, the city of Jacobabad topped 51 degrees Celsius. For those working in Fahrenheit, that's a lot. The extreme heat resulted in extreme melting of the glaciers that feed into the Indus River, which, of course, increased the water level. This, combined with an unusual low pressure system in the Persian Gulf, and, crucially, an early onset of the monsoon bringing torrential rain, resulted in a perfect storm, and far more water than the rivers and lakes could handle at once. In China, there was also an extreme heat wave earlier this summer. But this one was extraordinary. Noticing a pattern? Southern China recorded its longest period of continuous high temperatures since records began. Now, admittedly, that's only since the 1960s because of China in the 20th century, but the numbers stand on their own. An all-time temperature record for China, excluding the desert-dominated Xinjiang region, was set of 45 degrees Celsius in Beibei for two consecutive days and the city was over 40 degrees Celsius for a record 11 days. Meanwhile, a record nighttime temperature of 34.9 degrees Celsius was set in nearby Chongqing. And I just, I, I can't imagine trying to sleep in that. In fact, that's probably where the extra energy demand came from. Weather historian Maximiliano Herrera was quoted in New Scientist saying that this might be the most severe heat wave recorded anywhere. This combines the most extreme intensity with the most extreme length with an incredibly huge area all at the same time. In his opinion, there is nothing in world climatic history which is even minimally comparable to what is happening in China. Unlike in Pakistan, however, the extreme heat didn't result in extreme rain. In fact, the opposite happened, and rainfall dried up as did the nation's rivers. Blaming both of these events, which are kind of polar opposites to each other, on climate change then sounds a little nonsensical, but it is actually what we would expect to happen in a warming world. The thing to remember about the climate crisis is that it's not that the Earth's temperature is increasing. The amount of energy in the Earth system is increasing. Now that largely means that temperatures will increase, but they won't increase uniformly, you know, the same everywhere. Because by adding more energy to the system, you're changing how that system works. And based on our current understanding, we think that that means more likely and more intense maxima of temperatures. 
In other words, heat waves. Further, for each degree Celsius the air warms, it can hold about 7% more moisture. As the Earth has warmed by about a degree Celsius since pre-industrial times, we have measured an increase in the amount of water held in the Earth's atmosphere. That has two important implications. Firstly, because water is a greenhouse gas, the increase in humidity amplifies any warming caused by carbon dioxide. So it's a positive feedback. And secondly, more water in the atmosphere means that more precipitation, rainfall, is possible. But because the amount of energy in the system has increased, that doesn't mean that precipitation will just increase everywhere. Changes in precipitation patterns mean that while many areas will get wetter, some will get drier. And we can expect an increase in extremes on both ends, both wet and dry, as the planet warms. So while these events are shocking, they're not unexpected. But that's only if you hear about them in the first place. In covering the news, obviously there's a bias towards stories and topics that affect the viewer or the reader. So here in the UK, we mostly hear about news in the UK, unfortunately, and only hear about events in Pakistan and China if it's pretty important stuff. And I recognise that if we reported on all the bad stuff happening in the world, we'd probably all find it hard to get out of bed in the morning, because it would be overwhelming. But at the same time, I'm a little aghast at how little coverage the Chinese heatwave, and to a lesser extent, the Pakistani floods, have received. These are huge climate events, and they do affect you. They affect you through how interconnected the world economy is, and specifically because of how much manufacturing the West has outsourced to China, and that is going to be affected by this. And it affects you because you're living in the same atmosphere as China and Pakistan, and in a changing climate that could see similar events happening to you next. But perhaps most importantly, they affect you because you're a human being too. The reason I wanted to make this video is because on Twitter, in response to news of this heatwave, many people reacted with glee, saying that it's good that China is suffering under the climate crisis that it has caused, that this was some kind of justice. Firstly, this to me is an unfathomably callous attitude. I mean, if we're talking about Chongqing being nearly 35 degrees Celsius at night, that's a city the size of London, full of people just like you, trying to live their lives. Like the misery, the sheer misery that this heatwave has inflicted on people, let alone the excess deaths, which obviously we're not close to calculating yet. That misery has afflicted 900 million people. Again, people like you. This is awful. And secondly, who is responsible for the climate crisis? Not China. What matters when it comes to trapping more energy in the Earth's atmosphere is the total amount of carbon put into it. And when looking at the cumulative emissions of CO2 to date, China is responsible for about 12.7% of all the carbon put into the atmosphere to date. Compare that to Europe's 22% and the USA's 25%. Yes, China has the largest emissions of any country right now, but each Chinese citizen produces half the CO2 of an American. There just so happens to be over a billion Chinese citizens. So to wish harm on one of them for causing climate change isn't just morally wrong, it's factually wrong. I think one of the reasons why people may have this attitude is because quality coverage of the climate crisis can be hard to come by. I'm, I'm guessing, for example, that a lot of this video was news to you. So if you, like me, would like to stay up to date on this physical side of the climate crisis, then I have some recommendations. I've mentioned them before, but Carbon Brief is, I think, the best website for climate news. And you can sign up for their multiple newsletters on different aspects of the crisis. I'd also recommend checking out Skeptical Science, which is a website that mostly focuses on debunking myths about climate change, but also has a newsletter that summarises the latest research in climate. You can also go a bit closer to the source if you like and sign up for updates from journals like Science and Nature, which summarise the research for you and provide links to the papers themselves for further reading. And lastly, if you're on Twitter, there are any number of accounts I could recommend following, but two would be Scott Duncan and Catherine Hayhoe. Ultimately, what I'm getting at here is that what is happening in China and in Pakistan matters 
to you. It matters economically, it matters morally, and it matters because the scale of heat, of drought and of flood happening on the other side of the world is happening in a changing climate. A climate that you share. The way that we talk about stories from this changing climate is important. In response to a global threat, we cannot afford to be tribal. We cannot afford to disregard data. What is happening to people on the other side of the world is relevant to you. And I think you owe it to yourself to learn about their stories. Of course, somewhere else that you can learn about this changing climate is from myself, from our changing climates, from Real Engineering, from Second Thought, and from many other creators on Nebula who have kindly sponsored this video. Nebula, as you've probably heard by now, is the streaming service with over half a million users that is owned and operated by a group of educational YouTubers, including me. On Nebula, you get early access to our content, bonus videos and entirely original content such as Extremities by Wendover Productions, and do so without an ad in sight. Nebula has no ads, instead operating on a subscription model, and that subscription also gives you access to CuriosityStream, the number one source of high quality documentaries on the web. They have thousands of titles across every subject you can think of, and have plenty about China specifically, including The Colours of China, a series examining how a philosophy of colour thousands of years old is still relevant to a billion people today. You can get access to the big budget documentaries of CuriosityStream and the indie productions of Nebula at curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, also linked below, which gives you a 26% discount on both. That's just over a dollar a month for the best bits of YouTube, without the ads, and an endless supply of thought-provoking documentaries for all ages. With thanks to CuriosityStream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. Thank you very much for watching this video. Half of the sponsorship money from it is going to be donated to relief efforts in Pakistan. I'll also include a link down there in the description if you would like to donate to try and help people overcome this disaster. If you'd like to hear more about what happened with the wedding and just generally how I make these videos, then you can watch the behind the scenes vlog available on my Patreon. Patrons get access to a behind the scenes vlog every month, as well as getting early access to these videos. And now a couple of votes every now and again, choosing a topic for a video. So if that all sounds good, and you'd like to support this channel, please do check out my Patreon, also linked below. Here's some recommended viewing next, and I hope that you enjoyed this video and took something away from it. Please do pop it a like if you did. And that just leaves me to say thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.